Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this event is taking place on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri and the Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my deepest respects to the elders and ancestors of the Kulin Nation, as well as the custodians of the other lands from which people may be joining us today via the live stream link. I extend that respect to all First Nations people who may be with us this afternoon. Um, good afternoon, welcome to Collingwood Yards. My name's Amelia Wallen, I'm the director of West Space. And today's conversation with Julieta Aranda is the first in a series of activities collaboratively produced by West Space, Liquid Architecture and Bus Projects taking place here at Collingwood Yards. We're calling this collective practice disorganising. Disorganising is a practice in institutional solidarity. In a moment when our current economies are failing and traditional pedagogical institutions are facing crises of funding and support, finding alternative methods of organising is essential, as is questioning our relationship to current economic powers. For these reasons and more, we're delighted to be in conversation with Julieta Aranda, an artist whose expansive projects examine the practices of artistic exchange and question the economic relationships between people, objects, labour and time. In addition to her own artistic practice, Aranda is known as the co-founder of Eflux, uh, which was established in 1998 with Anton Vidokul. Born in Mexico City, Aranda works between Berlin, New York, and most recently, Melbourne. The circulation of objects and their ascribed value has been a continuous thread throughout Aranda's practice. Often rigorously site-specific, her projects are reimagined anew with each exhibition context, be it physical or digital. And this is true for projects such as Time Bank, which we're going to be hearing more about today. Active from 2009 to 2012, Time Bank existed as an online platform that treated time as currency in critique of the capitalist art market. Through exchanging the skills and time of artists, curators and writers, Time Bank proposed alternative notions of commerce through art making. And in just a moment, we're going to screen Aranda's film, Notes for Time Bank, from 2012. And then Julieta will speak for 20 minutes. We're going to take a short break. Julieta will speak for another 20 minutes, followed by another short break. And then we're going to be taking questions from the audience. Another quick housekeeping note um, is that we're going to be taking photographs of the event. If you don't wish to be photographed, um, please just see us at the back of the space. And please join me in welcoming Julieta Aranda. Um, thank you so much. Sorry about that. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to say a couple of things before I start the film. I am very nervous because I have not spoke, uh, spoken before an audience in more than one year. It's my first time with actual people and not a Zoom screen. So I am uh, like touched and nervous and a little bit emotional about the whole thing. So, uh, you know, better than mine, a bit of patience with me. And um, okay, so. Here goes the film. Maybe the lights, we can? Yeah, okay, great.
the bank. You are not supposed to talk about uh, your dreams. You are supposed to answer in a precise way. Exact. Exact is the word. And the exaction is the perfect compliance, the perfect compatibility between a formatted answer, uh, uh, question and a formatted answer. So the formatting of the human mind and the formatting of the human language is the main pathway of creation of the financial dictatorship. Hi, how may I help you? I'd like to cast a check, please. Sure, Mr. Evans. I'll just need to see your ID. You know what? I left my wallet in my car. I've banked here for about 10 years. You know, the branch manager knows me really well. Can you just cash it? I really don't want to go back out to my car. A. Apologize for the inconvenience and explain that policy requires you to see his ID. I'm sorry for the inconvenience, Mr. Evans, but bank policy requires that we see your ID in order to cash the check. Integration is totally lost nowadays because precarization, first of all, means that people never meet twice. 
in the same place. You are working in a place one day, the nine the other the following day, and um, it, it's your time, not your person that is implied in the process of production. So your time can be fragmented and recombined by the global network. Well, this uh, foundation of social solidarity is lost. A dollar is a dollar, a euro is a euro. Maybe a dollar is not equal to a euro, but every dollar is the same as any other dollar. You know, with time it's something quite, you know, if I'm really tired, if I'm really jet-lagged, or if I'm really de depressed, that hour is not the same hour compared to the situation when I'm really excited, when I'm really happy, or when I'm really focused or really inspired. Every hour feels completely differently. So how do you actually you know, how do you divide it? It's not like a sausage that you can cut into equal pieces. Labor for labor rejects interest on money, and consequently all banks and banking operations, together with all stock lobbying and the country word of the present system, is financiering.
and with institutions built up. These kind of social experiments cannot be called failures, because even if they don't fully take on, they shape possibilities, and they open the door for us to be able to imagine a different future, but even more importantly, a different present. It is quite interesting to see how alternative economies keep reappearing in history. They remain unfinished, but stubbornly keep coming back. At the end, what is really reassuring is that there is the continuity of a desire for things to be different. How do you mix the two cultures? How do you bring them together without either one of them having to negotiate? They don't. There's a clash that's uncomfortable. Those free zones are the things that we're having to learn now. I would say that we should replace the idea of need with the idea of desire. The object of our work and of our uh, um, consumption is not to be conceived as an object of need, but as an object of common desire. In this way, we can uh, enrich not only our personal relation to things, but our social sharing of pleasure.
It is fairly clear that things are not working quite right with the present system and that there is a massive mistrust in governing and regulating institutions as they are established at the moment. So, while the collapse of the present arrangement comes about or not, it is important to lay the grounds for different ways of doing things. Okay, so um, because of the, the time uh, division of the talk, what I was thinking about is that for the first 20 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about how this project came to be. And then after that, I will talk about actually why am I speaking about something that in terms of contemporary art happened a decade ago. Why am I choosing to speak about that now? So, um, just let me quit this film. Um, So sorry.
microphone working? Uh, hello? Okay, so. Okay, that was a uh, uh, beautiful pandemic moment. I do not know how to fix this, so we are going to have to live with, uh, with, uh, with, you know, with something not so elegant. And that is just that, so. Um, what I was saying, well, this is a time bank, but it is very hard for me to talk about time bank without talking about the, the breeding ground for it. So the breeding ground for that was Eflux, which is a project I have been working on for 20 years, which makes me feel really old, and I am, I am old, but it's, it's uh, for an internet thing, 20 years is like dinosaur time. Because um, the internet keeps being reinvented every couple of years, so it really it feels very strange to think in that kind of um, time perspective. Um, now, um, Eflux, of course, started as a as a um, I mean a way for us to make money because we were broke artists, and also because my partner on Eflux is from Russia, from Moscow, I am from Mexico. We were both not. Neither of us is the kid of oligarchs, so we grew up in a situation where all of our information, our access to culture was coming really third or fourth hand. Uh, by whichever, mag I mean, maybe, I don't know how it is in Australia, just because you guys are so far away from everything else, but it's, you know, like what we got was, you know, like magazines and photocopies and Sammy's dads and Magnetis dads, and then you knew that three years ago there had been an exhibition and everything was coming with a tremendous delay, and, uh, and everything was always happening elsewhere. So one of the points of Flux was to level the play field a little bit more and to create a situation where what was happening, that, that elsewhere, you know, the borders between the, that elsewhere and the center, to talk about that 90s idea of center and periphery, those borders would blur a bit, and actually there was a, a value and a timeliness and a kind of sense of, of these matters to things that were happening in other places. And maybe the, um, I mean, Eflux was run just by Anton and me for many years. So, uh, I had like fake uh, email addresses so that it would look like a big company. And the happiest moments of my life, I think, were in Christmas when I would get these you know, emails from some random person in Cairo being like, like just, you know, like sincerely, like, thank you so much because this actually changed things. And, and so anyway, the, after we ran Eflux as, as, a, as a, a service uh, for a number of years, um, us being artists, it, we became really itchy for wanting to do projects of our own uh, with the platform that we had created. So the first project that we made was Eflux Video Rental, which was an experiment um, on, on film and video distribution because um, like especially this, is, this predates YouTube and Vimeo and, and really high speed internet. Um, this was 2003, I think, when we thought it up and it opened in 2004 and it was um, of course what happens with artist film and video is that you get to see it mostly in a gallery in a museum context and if you are not in the place where the exhibition happens you are out of luck and even now i mean like when there are um, very few artists put their works on vimeo and uh, YouTube um, free of charge because they run into issues with their galleries because there is all these problems of authenticity and the original and who gets the right to watch what and who can own what uh, and, and so on. So um, this project was, at, at that time, all the video rental shops in New York were closing. All these mom and pop, uh, mom and pop shops like Kim's Video Rental. I don't know how many of you have been in New York, but there was a beloved place called Kim's Video Rental that I kind of like grew up in um, back in the day when I was a filmmaker. And and there was like an aleatory way in which you would encounter films that were not being suggested to you by Netflix or Amazon, but there was like a you know it was like a nerd uh, clerk or just like simple what your eyes fell on. And so we were trying to replicate that model and also one of the few ways in which we could get around um, angry galleries to make this work possible was to have everything on VHS. 
So we ended up getting um, about uh, 700, we started with 700 videos, at the end there were like over 2,000 works that we had to dub on B and to VHS to make this work happen, which was, which was our first artist project, which was also interesting because it, it was trying to examine the aesthetics of circulation of something, and it was really angrily received at the beginning, because it was like, you are not curators, what are you doing? It's like, it's not a curated project, you know? It's a, an, experiment, an experiment on circulation. So, I mean, it, it felt really interesting in that sense, like testing the boundaries between artists and curating, which now are happily broken. Um, but so, I, I am still very fond of this project. We ended it 10 years later. We thought it was going to last three months. It lasted three years, uh, 10 years, sorry, and we ended it when, when it got to the point where we realized that nobody had VHS players anymore, so in order to present the work, people had to take, people had to rent, I mean, everything was for free, but people had to take the VHS tape home and the VHS player. So it just became cumbersome, and it was like, okay, so no more, it's over. Um, it, it was shown many times in many places, and then it found a um, happy life in Ljubljana, um, where it lives to this day in a reproduction of the original space where it was installed, which was a tiny um, storefront. After that project, we made um, a, a, another uh, experiment on circulation, which was modeled after a pawn shop, um, which was a really heartbreaking project. This was, uh, um, you know, like the like pawn shops are really sad places where you go and see like uh, wedding rings and all kinds of broken dreams and things that are pawned in times of need by people that think they will be able to get them back but rarely can. Um, and we were like trying to figure out um, issues of value back then. You know what happened? I mean, like an art an artwork. Yeah, you make a painting with maybe twenty dollars worth of material, and then all of a sudden there is a slate of hand, something that happens, and that same work becomes a million dollars. So when when the transformation happens, like what is the when is value generated? So the point of the pawn shop was to um, ask artists to bring their works. Everybody got a flat fee of a hundred dollars, or actually ninety-nine, ninety-nine, and and then they could get it back if they wanted to. And if they did not pick up their work within a month, then it would be um, uh, you know put on sale. Um, we realized a few things after that project. One, uh, one thing was that, the, the, that those $99 actually meant a lot for some artists, because this was at the beginning of the financial crisis and things were like really going, down, uh, going to hell. This was 2008. And, and, and also, I mean, we also realized that we were terrible salespeople because we could, we could never sell anything that we accumulated on the pawn shop. It's still sitting in a, in a storage room in Berlin. Um, but also, you know, like that artists did not, and that's what, hap you know, that's what happens to artists. They don't get their work back. It ends up taking, taken by galleries. People assume that you are going to get, that you can make more of it, so why are you so stingy with it? Why do you care about the money? When you are an artist, it doesn't matter, you know, like what you do, you do it for love. It's, you know, it's, uh, the value is somewhere else. It's pleasure, you enjoy it. Oh, why do you worry about money? And then the money from work ends up being made by the secondary market and galleries and collectors that resell your work and so on. And it's no accident that um, artists in both in the former East and in the West have died destitute while their work sells for millions to this day, you know? You have always this like sad story of artist dies in alone, commits suicide, had tuberculosis, uh, and, and so on. These are like, like uh, horror stories of... Um, this is, I mean, like, this is all what made the Time Bank exist. I think I just got a sign for, in the back that I am going over time, so we'll... Um, Maybe I stop here and we take those five minutes and then I'll tell you how all this resulted in a time bank and why it matters so much to me to revisit this project today. So, 
Five minutes.
Okay, so now it works. Now I'm feeling professional again. Okay, so then let's start again. So we are welcome to Time Bank. Now that I can, uh, that I explained what it came from, we can start the, like, so I'm going to run you through the project super quickly, just like what it was and what it has been, so I can talk about what it could be. So Time Bank started as an exploration of, uh, after Pawn Shop was uh, this like, heartbreaking endeavor of both figuring out that for artists like $99 actually really meant being able to pay your studio rent or not and that um, also realizing how predatory and, and rigged the market is because obviously we could you know we had like works by fantastic people yeah we had like uh, work by Lawrence Wiener and work by Henry Sala and Martha Rosler and Hito Steyer and Liam Gillick and we couldn't sell it and people like really sharky people kept calling us on the phone and being like can I buy it like really cheap and it's like no no of course you can't and like I know how much this is worth I may not be able to sell it for the for its real price but I know what this is worth so no and I'm not this the difference here is that I'm not desperate I'm not so no um, and so that, 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 I mean, like the project kept the question of the creation of value when it comes to the arts really open, and that's where the time bank um, came into being, you know, like trying to understand and to figure out what, was the, what is the value and to give value to the things that we do. I mean, time is money, but time is much more than money. So how, how could we create that kind of value for ourselves? And the project started a little bit, I mean, like it has a historical basis. I'm like showing you here um, um, the, like, like a bunch of the research that we did. There was a, a project in the, in, I think, 1830 something called the Cincinnati Times Store that was started by a guy called Josiah Warren, who started like a project on mutualism trying to do labor exchange. There was also um, New Harmony, which was a, a really utopian community in Indiana that was started by Robert Owen, who was a, a dreamy industrialist, let's say that, that um, tried to start uh, a labor exchange in England. Also, I don't have the date fresh on my mind. I'm sorry, I used to, but that they, they fell off. Um, and the, so it was, this was a labor exchange, it's funnily same as New Harmony, it ran for two years happily. They actually had proper money, or not money, but currency that they were exchanging, where um, what was worth was, like essentially the difference is that what was worth was the labor, yeah, like um, not the, not, I mean, what had worth was your labor, not the money that you were paid for the labor. So there was not this like additional step there. Um, and one of the things that intrigued me there was like the trying to empower like working hours and time and like to kind of like liberate the, the labor from it being translated into money and that and, and to have worth in its own right. And I think that came, that, it, that always happens when there are inflations and like terrible moments. I mean, like this also happened in Germany. This is like a, another heartbreaking photograph of a woman trying to, realizing that she doesn't have enough money to buy um, wood for the fireplace, but she can use the money that she has as combustible for the, as fuel for the fireplace. So this kind of like um, strange, ridiculous moments of like, that make you really consider what the value of money is. Um, in Germany, something that happened um, after that inflation was a, something called Notgeld, which uh, when, you, when you had like this kind of like, this is like Zimbabwe, yeah? Like one trillion dollar currency, you had five billion mark uh, bills. So Notgeld was um, uh, like each town would issue a kind of currency that was Notgeld means specifically not money. And it was, uh, something that would allow them to exchange, but also hide a kind of be like specific beauty so you could also be satisfied with having the currency itself as payment for something without needing to trade it further. They were all super beautiful. 
I mean, some of them, like this one, were like hand embroidered and so on. And I mean, that, that kind of uh, endeavor, this is like something that I like. And I, I, when I think about these kinds of histories and this kind of like blips in time, you know, they always tell you, oh, like, but that failed, or that failed, but it doesn't fail, yeah? Like, it continues in, in it conti it's like the kind of, like, history that runs underneath his, the, the big history, and it just keeps popping up whenever, there, whenever it needs to, whenever it has to. So that's, I mean, like, this is, these are images from a project called Ithaca Hours that a friend called Paul Glover started in Ithaca, Ithaca New York. That's also a time-based uh, economic system. Um, now, the thing with the time bank is that it was really trying to not just exchange labor, yeah? Not just be, I'll do your plumbing if you cut my child's hair, but to try to understand value that is much harder to apprehend, which is artistic value, and the things that we do, and you know, like, okay, so you, maybe you do a painting in half an hour, but you spend two months agonizing about the subject matter and what you would do and the gesture and so uh, to, what counts there the half an hour that you spend in the work or the two months that you agonized over it how many times you got drunk with friends talking about it the night that you could not sleep you know what what, what are those hours worth something so time bank was a specifically a project trying to examine the value of that time and it was really closed into the, into, you know, into, into the community that I understand. I'm no economist by any means. And it, it also had to, I mean, like these are just, um, and I'm showing you very quickly, equivalences that people suggested for, that could be the currency that went from banana bread to, you know, people like going through specific bills to cal um, calculator tape to intervened notes to ropes tied into knots to counting time on a prison cell to this and this is the one that we chose for a specific reason um, this was uh, uh, Lawrence Weiner's idea he's uh, full disclosure he's a very good friend um, the and the the reason to use Lawrence Weiner's uh, notes is also a little bit like the German not guilt, yeah, like it has a value intrinsic to it because if, if somebody gets this, they are, you know, like, third, I mean, we came up with some elaborate system of equivalence, but the point is if somebody gets their hands in like a, a set of time notes, knowing that they are serialized and they were made for, by Lawrence Winner, they may just keep them. They may not just, they may not put that time back into circulation. So that would be a win for the bank. And the idea for, the idea to, I mean, like, what would make, what would make time, I mean, like, time banking is a zero sum economy. You cannot have more than 24 hours in a day. It's not possible to hoard. It's, it's so it's, the, the idea of it was to figure out ways to, I mean, this is mentioned in the video, right? You have um, different time values, you know, like an hour is spent, at, as I did today, an hour is spent thinking about immigration issues is not as fun as an hour that you spend uh, hanging out with your lover. It's very, very, so there are people that spend their entire lives in shit time value. and they are still expected somehow to produce meaning. And so that's the kind of like difference that, that we are trying to figure out. Like we call this time laundering, yeah? Like the, the, how, how can you make sure that there is pleasure in what you do and that the pleasure is not exempt from value because that's what happened to us. That's what happens to us as artists, right? Because we seem to enjoy what we do. We don't need to get remunerated. And that, that this still happens. That's like what, what, what now is called the exposure economy. Um, anyway, more examples of time money, time currency, time is money, it's much more than money. And then these are examples of how the time bank was uh, presented. Uh, this was Frankfurt, Porticus. This is when we decided to make a time store and try to figure out ways to actually create exchanging 
uh, restaurant where I was a cook and um, um, every meal was uh, costed half an hour and uh, I cooked for 60 people every day. I loved it very much. Um, and, and then, it, I mean, it has been super interesting to, to see the exchanges that people propose. The, like the posters that you see there are, are like the exchanges, you know, what people propose to exchange in the time bank. As I said, it's not like um, plumbing for meatballs, but it was more like, okay, I uh, miss my dog and my landlord does not let me have a dog, so I am happy to walk your dog. And I am a doctor, but what I really like is gardening, so, but I don't have a garden, so I would love to tend your garden. And it was like this idea of creating a situation that did something beneficial for two parties and provided pleasure. And, and just like trying to examine the value of that pleasure. Um, I think that I had a bit of, um, of uh, then the, we presented the project in Documenta 13, the one that uh, Carolyn Christopher Carby uh, 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 curated, and I think I had a, a rich burn down with this project when I realized that it, this was like the best that you can hope for a project like this, but all the people that went to see it had no time to engage with it as a time bank. <laughs> Everybody wanted, wants to see Documenta in two days and they can't, so it was really a downer. Like really, like um, you know, like you're like okay, this is like the best that I can expect for my work, but like damn, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work. So um, this is how it was presented, and I was you know like, like both very happy, of course, because that's what you want for yourself, but also disappointed. And I think that's uh, one of the reasons that, and after that, it was presented mostly as a gesture which for this particular project makes me very unhappy when it's just like a documentation of itself. And, and that's what brings me back to thinking about that today, right? Like, uh, because I was talking about time being, like the value of time being really different, like depending on what it is that you are doing. And then what happens is that for this past year, we have all been doing the same thing and time got really flattened. So what is, and everybody, I mean like, what was public space became a very strange corporate public space where we are all hanging out in work conditions in Zoom rooms, which is all corporately owned. So it has no, like no real resemblance of uh, joy and pleasure and, and like not even like that, like, I mean, I, I realized that I even stopped um, calling people on the phone or that I, I, that actually I don't know how to talk to people anymore. So and the, the idea of like figuring out again how to, how to clean time and how to get rid of this obligation to, to have time flattened into the table where you, you know, where you cut your vegetables is where you place your computer is where you change your kid is, and, ev and everything is the same and you're wearing your pyjama as forever. Um, I mean, that's what the last year was. Uh, not here anymore, but that's what it is still in many, many places. So I'm trying to think how to actually revisit this project in a way that is meaningful 10 years after. And, and that's where this conversation is, uh, um, is at now. I mean, like, I think there are many, I mean, like many things from like, um, uh, you know, but again, this is like something that always happens in conversation, not something that I can decide in. Because what happened with this project also is that with Time Bank, when it was happening, is that it it had uh, many branches and every venue and every community they could exchange with each other, but it's essentially a very local thing because there is like systems of trust. Money is anonymous, but trust is trust, you know, you have to, so even though as artists, we actually, I mean, like I have been enjoying that in Melbourne very much right now. I automatically plugged into a community that we kind of, kind of like vaguely know each other from before, and, and there is pre-established trust, which is something that I would not have had if I had just come to Melbourne in a 
in a, you know, in a different uh, capacity. So, um, you know, how to play with that in these times of restricted geographies and even restricted, restricted, restricted localisms. So that's the, I mean, that's kind of like the conversation that now I think once we take uh, the next five minute break, we can open the floor and try to talk about this together. Um, I, I just ended. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, so, yeah, we take five minutes and then maybe it would be good to actually talk about that. And
everyone for rejoining us. Um, we might open the floor up to questions. If anyone has a burning question for Julieta, I'll bring the microphone around so that those joining us by live stream can um, hear the question. Anyone? I've, I've got one to kick us off. Um, Julieta, I was wondering about the principle of pleasure in Time Bank, and you spoke about that being an important quality, particularly, you know, the examples of gardening and dog walking and time bank being an opportunity for pleasure. I'm wondering if you could expand on that at all and what, particularly if you're thinking about revisiting time bank, how pleasure might it's, feature. I mean, like that, I can talk a lot about that, <laughs> like that. I mean, the, you know, like it starts, uh, uh, I think, with the, Time is money equivalence, yeah? Like, that's like the easy thing and the easy way to understand your own worth. And, I mean, like, it's, uh, it, like, especially now, yeah? Like, when we are thinking about the, the economic climate of a pandemic and you're thinking about what we have deemed essential workers, yeah? These are people that are essential and, the vast majority of them are at minimum wage. It's uh, grocery store clerks and nurses and people that work at um, old people homes and child minders. And so what we deem essential and what we deem worth it are very different things. And, and then I'm wondering, okay, so of these essential people, how many, what's, what is, the amount of pleasure that they take in their essential jobs. I mean, you know, is, so I'm clapping for nurses and doctors. Yeah, like, does that make them get paid better? I mean, is that, does that make them feel good or does that make me feel good? Um, um, it's, I mean, like that, that, that's the whole point of trying to, to figure out, I mean, and, and again, you know, like the, sorry, I need to take this out. Oh, okay, better. Um, with Time Bank, it's, uh, it was, it had something to do with the position of artists and like the being always forced into this kind of like to take this strange high road that it's because that money is dirty yeah like you're an artist money is dirty you're not doing this for the money you're doing it for some higher thing that no nobody ever told me what that high thing is it's uh, it's not there i have a child and my child needs to go to school and it needs to go to the dentist and it you know concrete needs the, so, uh, of course, nobody expects a child, uh, an artist to have a family and a child and things like that. Basically, we are constructed as these perfect capital, subjects of capital. You know, atomized units, you go to a residency, you cannot bring your partner or child, you are alone, you go two months here, you go three months there. And you are deployed in this kind of like incredible neoliberal ways. So, um, and what kind of pleasure is there in it? I mean, like, and I, I keep thinking about that more and more, more when I think about the, the, the new, I mean, like the new thoughts I've been having about this project, yeah? It's also that, I think I spoke about that with you, the, the art world model is kind of like based on um, Radiators, yeah? Where you go to art school, and I don't know if, if you went to art school, you were probably told something like this, you are sitting here, look to your left, look to your right, none of these people will make it, <laughs> you know? And that's basically a way of saying, you know, like Hail Caesar, go into the arena and fight to the death and may the best man win. And when I think about it, I mean, like, I hated that as a student. And now that I am 10 years, more than 10 years after I graduated, I hate it even more. And I don't think that that is a system that I want to even... So now that I, I, I switch to the other side, and I'm teaching now, I'm not a student anymore. I don't want to teach people to continue into that system. There is no pleasure. There is, there is no pleasure in backstabbing your peers. You know, who said that crap, you know? Um, great art, the good artists make work, great artists steal. That's, and that's another, um, I, I don't remember, there's like a apocryphal been attributed to Picasso, but I don't think it was Picasso. 
but just this idea that great artists steal, yeah, like it, it just kind of like gives you the license to back cut the floor from someone. And while at the same time as artists, we are being asked to do all kinds of um, social work, yeah, and that our work matters, and because it needs to have an exchange value, and it often really doesn't. So, can you fix, or can you pretend to fix a housing crisis? Can you pretend to fix, um, I don't know, issues of representation, while at the same time trying to kill your peers? And there is a kind of like cognitive dissonance in which you have to engage to enter that kind of game. And, and I'm extremely tired of that. And I think that we all are, and that the, that system is really not, uh, I mean, it's, it's not conducive, it's not productive, it's, uh, it's run to its end. I mean, I don't know how many of you know the book of uh, Richard Florida called The Creative Class. Um, and that's basically uh, the proposition of gentrification by way of art, you know? You give, if you want to revamp a derelict neighborhood, what do you do? You ship studios to artists, cheap or free. And then they will of course flock there. The next thing you do is you open a Japanese restaurant and then a specialty coffee shop. And then in two years you kick out the artists and raise the rents. Meanwhile, you develop a bunch of condos. And that's a model that has been happening for the last 25 years, I would say. And it has proven successful, and it's also proven, I mean, successful in, in the sense for real estate developers, I guess, but not for us. I mean, I still think about Mondrian, and I think about Kandinsky, and I think about, um, I mean, I am blanking on the name of one of my favorite artists that killed himself, uh, that I always wish I made his work. Um, what's his name? Oh, dang. American artist in Los Angeles killed himself like about three years ago. Mike Kelly, thank you. I'm thinking about people like Mike Kelly. Yeah, like you think that's, that that's a person that would be immune to this system. So why did, why did this guy kill himself? He was actually a millionaire. And he killed himself because a girlfriend had broken up with him. And he was so alienated from the, from the world that the only person he spoke with was his gallerist at that point. And, and that's, I mean, I, you know, I keep thinking about it being this gladiator style construction. So I am kind of convinced that it's possible in this sense of pleasure and time laundering and figuring out what actually means to do things for each other is not that is not you know doing something for somebody else is not doing something that makes you feel good sometimes it actually may not feel good um, but that you know I want to I imagine that after this this year of flattened time it's possible to imagine another time together so long answer um, did anyone else have a question? Thank you. Hi. I was just wondering with the, the concept of the time bank, is the idea in very concrete terms, in terms of the exchange that someone, so for example with the restaurant when you were cooking, that, that the people who eat the food, that they give you half an hour of their time, that you can then claim later? I mean, like the idea of that, uh, the reason why it was a bank is that it was triangulated. Yeah, they didn't owe, I mean, like, so my investment in the bank was my time cooking. So people then owed, I mean, like, that's, that's an example. Yeah, you spend maybe three hours cooking, more actually, because it was like 60 people, but a bunch of hours cooking, but then 60 people come and each of them have to spend half an hour. So that's clearly uh, uh, profit for the bank, yeah, like, because I put my four hours into cooking, let's say it's four hours cooking into the bank, but then that got um, 30 hours back. Now, they didn't uh, owe them to me. They put them into the bank, so they had a debt to the bank, and someone then could, 
you know, one of them could be a translator and somebody could be like, oh my God, I have an artist statement, you know, uh, in Polish and you happen to be a Polish translator. Could you do this for me? And so on. So. So this is probably the opposite of um, the question of like pleasure, but um, there's an article on Eflux at the moment by I think Alberto Lu Luce, uh, who talks about the um, university and the prison being different sites of um, like mechanisms of the same apparatus, one being privilege and the other being oppression. Um, and art, as you've described it, outside of the prison is a this competitive, um, sort of like self-deprecating in a way, um, whatever, uh, battleground. Whereas in a prison, it pro provides potentials for rehabilitation. Um, do you have any comments on like the potential of platforms like eFlux in maybe, um, breaking apart some of these mechanisms of privilege and oppression? I, I mean, uh, what I can say is that we try, you know, when it comes to real privilege, we are too small. I mean, we are good, and, and you know, like we have tried, at some point you try and you think, look, okay, what's my real size? What can I actually do? And it's like, okay, I can give visibility to certain voices. You know, I can, I can make, I mean, we excel at circulation. That's what we do. When it comes to the real pushing of gears, that is, I mean, you know, we can talk to people that can actually push those gears, but I mean, that's simply something that exceeds a 10 people operation. I wish. Well, do you think it has the potential to help? I'm keep? sorry, I, say again. Do you think? Um, art has the potential to help keep, if artists work together, to keep people of color, marginalized people out of prisons, especially when they're being pushed out of areas like Collingwood into... I mean, yeah. I would hope, you know, I would really hope. I mean, sometimes I, I you know, I think about it. I mean, like I'm, I'm going to get personal in that sense just because uh, it's uh, fitting. I mean, I, I'm, I come from a really poor family in Mexico, so, my choices in life were pretty I mean, I can tell you what my family does. It's not fun. None of, none of it is fun or glamorous or anything. So, um, of course, art was like a giant gamble. Uh, and I mean, like it has the theoretical potential for class mobility, you know, like the, the because nobody questions you and so on. So, of course, the thing that I encountered was like a decade, a decade later, is like people assuming that I was the daughter of a Mexican oligarch because that's the only people that would actually be in the particular position that I was occupying. So, um, um, having seen those two sides, like yes, art has the potential to do that. But it, it's also fiercely protected um, and, uh, and turned into an elite, uh, you know, like purveyors of bespoke, uh, bespoke goods. Yeah, like that's what we do. So, yes, it can change. I mean, it can do it and it can change, but it's it not in the condition that it is at the moment. Um, I think we've run over time, unless there's one more burning question. Um, no? <laughs> yes, we can. I mean, one thing, when, I, when you shared the video with me, it, and it's an obvious observation that I'm sure everyone came up with, is that with the floating of the dollar, it was no longer pegged to the gold standard and yet we still behave within the, the hour, 24-hour time. The, so I was wondering, within this change, and you, you talked about other types of temporal um, calendars like um, China, like how might we 
steal back time? I don't know really what the answer is, but it was more of a, a kind of thought experiment I had in terms of if, if we feel like we're running out of time and we're victims of this attention economy, as you should sort of discussed with what happened with the work in Documenta, is how do we kind of have a, a temporal revolution that sort of goes against, you know, like a lot of people started a couple of years ago started talking about like so, s slow projects or, or slowing down. But I'm also wondering how do we, uh, if time, yeah, like the fixity of time, can that be um, recalibrated to allow more freedom rather than this kind of um, pressure cooker of, of always not having enough of it? You know, I was having a conversation um, with, uh, uh, with some of the people from Ruan Grupa uh, two days ago, or actually yesterday morning. And something that we agreed on is, I mean, like, I, I think that the word productive is almost an insult. Yeah, I do not want to be my most productive self. Um, and I do not want to be my most, I mean, like, the, I think that this kind of, uh, the kind of immense value that is placed on productivity as, as putting out tangible goods on the table and efficiency and this kind of like running yourself ragged in the pursuit of I don't know what. I mean, I know that uh, I cannot make more than um, it's bad. If I try to do more than that, my ideas get weak and I'm, you know, and it's all watered down and it's, and it, I'm running myself into shit. So why would I be that productive? Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, like, so it would, but it would take, of course, people organizing and agreeing or not backstabbing and saying, okay, if you step back and if we all agree to step back, am I going to quietly take advantage and be super productive and super efficient and, and, and run forward. I mean, like, you know, it's, it's something about like, I mean, like in a system like the one that we have as artists, which is really horrible, you know, how can we build something where we can trust each other, where we can actually really, really trust each other? Thank you. Um, Please join me in thanking Glenda, our Auslan interpreter, and Julieta Aranda for the amazing talk. Thank you so much. <laughs>